Hello. Uh, here's another chapter of our book club. Our learning objectives are uh, to explain real world application of predictive modeling, introduce to primary modeling approaches, explain the model development process. Uh, so I think, Mo, could you mute your, your microphone, please? Thanks. Explain the model development process framework, provide a comprehensive notation guide for model development, and introduce the notation and model representation. When we are creating models, we have two main goals. Maybe we are creating models for explanatory. Models are explain, applied to inferential purpose like testing, hypothesis, or predicting modeling. Models are used to predict the value of a new or future observation. That is the, the focus of this book. We have some examples in the book. We can create a model for scoring the risk of a, trans a, a transaction in a large financial company can take several months because you have to know a lot of implications. So you need to take care of what is the model doing, the interpretation to improve the accuracy because if the model is not accurate enough, where the company will lose money, or oh, many people can be affected. Also, you can create a model for predicting the demand of deliveries in a small pizza chain. Uh, you can quickly update the model and even discard the model without major consequences. So when we are creating a model, we need to understand what is the implication of what we are doing. One of the main aspects we need to take in consideration is that we need to have a plan. We need to have a plan because it it uh, it helps us to define the resources needed to develop the model and also to maintain the model. Uh, make, and also make sure that important is there are, are not missing when developing the model. Uh, and we have a really good a phrase of Winston Churchill, a, who he fails to plan is planning to fail, basically. So this is, what is this chapter about? How we are going to plan our modeling process? The first reference we have is the Chris PDM, the cross industry standard for process in data mining. It's a tool agnostic process, so you can apply it no matter uh, what language or even tool you are using. And basically it can, it have these steps. So you have business understanding when you define the objective of the business. It, in this uh, step, you define even if is worth it, it's reasonable to, to start the, the project. And also you start understanding the data, where the data comes from, what are the implications of the data. Then you go to data preparation and modeling. You will be back and forth between modeling and preparing the data. And then you will be evaluating the model. And based on the, the evaluation, you will redefine your objective or maybe go to the deployment. Or you would do both. <laughs> so they have this another approach is more like more practical related. The cycle of predictive model, they have starting with data preparation. So you start designing your experiment, uh, the data acquisition process, where the data comes from, the data cleaning. In this case, it's no cleaning for development, just cleaning, uh, oh, that should be a numeric column, but it have a, it's in characters. Uh, and, and so it's like normalizing, normalizing the data. Also, we have that understanding 
data exploration, variable selection, variable engineering. And the, in variable engineering, yeah, you are making the variables uh, more suitable, depending on the model that you are going to train. Model assembly, assembly. Here you have the model selection, the parameter estimation, or the feeding, and hyperparameter tuning, when you select the best model possible. Then you have the model audit, uh, that's the phase that is the most important part of this book. When you validate data validation, model validation, and model benchmarking. And at the end, we have the model delivery, model deployment, documentation, and communication. As the steps in the CRISDM uh, are interactive, uh, sometimes you you need to spend at the same time uh, you need to 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 take time to main steps that are related to another step. So basically they create like a matrix here when we have every row is a CRISDM step and we have also five columns and each of the bars uh, represent a weak wall low. So in the first week, we will have more time uh, in the problem formulation. And also we will have be a little bit understanding the data, but not, not auditing the model because there is no model to, to audit. But maybe we are going to start making a little bit of the documentation of the model as we understand what is the purpose. And as you see here, it's not like that you just do one step at one time, it's like a, a continuous process. You have your main attention here and you slowly go moving from problem formulation to risk modeling that is creating the model. Then you go to fine tuning. Then you will start, as you are tuning your model, you will start to to validate the results. Uh, and also start working on the delivery because you know what kind of resources you will need depending on the model that you do. And here we have a little bit more details of this framework. We have the stage one is problem formulation, defining the data sets that will be used for training and validation deciding which performance measure will be used for the evaluating the performance of the final model. Uh, the grid modeling, focusing on the creation of the first versions of the model, uh, and if I how complex the model needs to be. In fine tuning, we focus on the providing initial version of the model, selecting the best one according to the predefined metrics, and maintenance and test commission, risk commissioning, uh, monitoring the performance of the model after if implementation. That, that's the main problem. So you say, okay, yeah, there's no, we are not going to be using this model. It's not useful and we are going to take them away. The book also takes some time to explain why is the notation here because it might differ from prior books we have written. Uh, for example, capital letters, like these ones, uh, relates to random variables. Uh, it's like the, the a, a column, basically, but no still in, the, in a data frame. The lower case uh, is just a value of that vector. But when we have an underline, now we, it's a it's a it's a matrix. If we are talking about the edge, we are talking about the predictors uh, matrix. Here we have the lower with with a uh, underline. It refers to basically a row in the in, the, in our data and you can transpose. 
the f function refers to expected value, that is the mean. Bar refers to variance. And here, this script refers that we are going to take the, the mean of the, the y based on the x values. Like, oh, I want to know the, the, mean, the mean salary of people that live in New York. So you expect to see New York here, for example, that would be the S. That's the the dependent uh, variable. But this is the, the, the center one is the main notation. So you are expecting to see the Y based on S. The salary based on some city or any other uh, argument that we want to filter our data. The Y represents our dependent variable. Uh, you, you have a lowercase and also an I here as a suit screen. That's an observation, a row, basically. And represent the number of observations in our training data. P is the number of exploratory variables or predictors. Um, basically, uh, here they are explaining that when you say, oh, I have Si, it have P dimensions because for each predictor, because it's a, it's a row, basically. When you have a lower S with an asterisk, it's an observation of interest. No, maybe our point of the training data, but maybe some value, maybe you are making a sensitivity analysis, sensitivity analysis. And you know, oh, I don't have any of this value in our data, but I want to know what happens if you change that value to this other value. So, and that, that's basically what they want to point here. When you have a lowercase j as a salt script, it refers to the number of the column. And here you can see how the S with a lower bar, a specified a specific observation, a, a row basically, a, in our beta. So we have P columns. As we have the, the J right here, to apply the power, we need to use parentheses. So you, if you don't see a parentheses, that's not power. It's just the number of the column. This symbol, a calligraphic J, represents a subset. It's like, okay, if I don't want to take just one column, I can pick several columns using this symbol. And you have a negative before that J. Now you are excluding that subset from the from the data. If you see this notation of C, you are representing that you have a row, and the J column have the C the C value. The other ones keep the same. You have an asterisk J that is a matrix with the values of a matrix instead of the J which elements are permuted. So basically, if you see that asterisk in a J, you know that we are making permutation. Permutation is a random sample. You are sampling one column. A, without repetition. So you will say, oh, you say that it doesn't have effect and you rearrange the order of the columns using a random zip. Uh, if the variable is important, the mother should suffer a decrease in accuracy. If the variable 
is not important, the model would be the same. That's basically a test that we will see later, I think. And also we have this uh, I for the residual, that is the our uh, original value versus our predicted value. Any doubt or the notation or any comment? Okay. I'll just point out, yeah, the, the notation here, I, I would say, is a little atypical uh, from what I've seen and used in the past, right? In particular, the uh, underlined uh, uh, variables to indicate, what is that, it, vectors and or matrices is a little a little different. Like normally I see the, the bar. Um, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a couple other things are just maybe, you know, a little different from what I'm used to, like with the asterisks uh for the observation of interest but um yeah it's it's mostly straightforward it's just uh just a little different exactly uh, mm -hmm. maybe you know the under the underscore under the the bar to to say that is a matrix to me was new you know and the j for the column that's something that i have never seen before yeah yep i'm with you there mm -hmm. but you know you have the summary and you can check if you have a doubts later because there are these have a lot of equations. Uh, model description. So when we are training a model, we're trying to find a function in the R, uh, I think, dimensions. It's like, uh, yeah, that transform that into a number. That basically that you are trying to take a lot of num a lot of values in that space and turn into a real number. That's the result that we want to see. The model represent the book can be used directly uh multivariable dependent uh, well uh, multivariable dependent variables. Basically what say okay for most of our models we just want to predict one value. But there are some models that can predict more than one value. And this method could also be applied, but they don't explain here how you can do it. But you can do it. <laughs> That's something that they say. So our first step, that understanding. In that understanding phase, we create tabular summaries. We apply some statistical methods. And we, most of the time, use visualization techniques. And we want to explore the distribution of a single variable. We want to understand, we can use an histogram for continuous or categorical variables. And also we can use empirical cumulative distribution, as you can see this cool. So here's a histogram. Also we have the empirical community distribution plots. For relationship between pairs of variables, we can use post plots to, to explain the relation between categorical versus continuous variables, mosaic plot for two categorical variables, or scalar plot for two continuous variables. That's the, the graphic that we are going to use across this book. And Sometimes we need to also take some time to understand the dependent variable, not just the predictors. As for the as approximation of normality or symmetry is a common question when you are exploring the, the predicted variable, the, the, the dependent variable of the distribution. That's important if you are planning to use a linear model or a general linear model or a rich or less of regression because they expect that the output is normally distributed. Confirm if the proportion of observation in different categories is balanced or not, as most of categoric uh, classification methods do not work well if the categories are substantial in balance. That's the main two points that you want to know if you are 
you, you are exploring your dependent variable. But as uh, you see there, in the in you are you have a continuous variable as an output. Uh, it doesn't matter too much. It doesn't matter too much unless you you really need to use those those methods. But the main point of this book is that you don't you don't need to use it because you have another tool to interpret more complex models. Understand explanatory variables. Uh, now you can investigate their distribution in identify variables per, per, persistent leader variability. Yeah, if a variable is just, you have a column with just a value or just change 0, 0 0.1% of the time, uh, your model won't do anything with that variable. So if you find that and you can remove it, that's a great step before. A relationship between exploratory variables and samples. Because strongly correlated exploratory variables can produce problems when optimizing algorithms. Why? Why? Because if you have two variables that are so correlated, the model won't know what is the, the source of the of the pro of the output. Maybe you have a variable A and a variable B, and he doesn't know what which of the two ones are important. So yeah, we need to be aware of the correlation that we have in our models. Even though some of our predicted models can take them out, but it also be, be challenging even for interpretation. So the, the common instruction that you maybe combine them, create just one variable, if they are too strongly correlated. Relationship uh, with the dependent variable. The variable uh, selected features are not appear to be related to the dependent variable. I just don't see any any relations. It, it, sometimes you you can discard the variable trans transformation to main linear relation. For example, sometimes you just explore the variable, the relationship. Oh, they are related, but the relation is not linear. Maybe let me apply some log or maybe a, an exponent, a power just to, to linear the, the relationship. That would be also really useful. In the model assembly, the feeding part, we want to define the distribution of the dependent variable given a some variable x. Uh, some value maybe, you know, it's a, this is an observation. Uh, we usually do not evaluate the entire distribution, but we just some uh, character, we, we just get some characteristics. Like you really, you would like to know the entire distribution of Y, but that's not always possible. So you can uh, uh, estimate the expected value the variance around that prediction at what time. We say that we have a good model. Uh, if that model can approximate uh, the value within the performance metric. The model feeding is a process of selecting the value of model coefficients that minimize the function L. Basically, we want to have, we want to tune our coefficients based of the this data that reduce the distance between Y and the predicted values. And, and that's it, that's our, the, our co coefficients. We have this, and based on our prediction, we can also calculate the expected square error of prediction. It has three components. We start the variable variability of Y around the conditional expected value. This function, you see, this coefficient are not estimated. 
they are like the the hypothesis, like the functions that we think that exist, but we don't know what we what is the function. It's like the perfect function in a perfect world, that is the function that bear that bear describes the the phenomenon that we are studying. And we select and we take the difference between our results, the values that we see in our predicted variable, and that function, that difference of the error, uh, we cannot reduce that error because it's just noise. It's just noise of our problem. On the other hand, if the other parts are related to the to the model, the perfect model that we don't know and the model that we really train. If our coefficients, uh, we have also the difference between the expected value and it estimate. It, here is the square bias. And the bias is basically how our predictions, uh, our values change based on maybe our model, I think, yeah. If, what assumption we have on the data. If the, if for example, the perfect model is a linear regression and we are training a decision tree, you know, that's the amount of error that we have for that difference. So uh, we say that the, maybe one of the highest bias uh, arguing is the last of regression because you are based on the data removing variables. But also the linear regression has a lot of bias because it's assumed a really certain form of, of the function. And yeah, uh, as we reduce this bias, it, these two errors are related. And the second one is the variance of the models. Basically, we want to know how much our mother, our expected value change uh, if we change the data. You are training your model with some data, but if that data change, uh, how much change the prediction? How much change your coefficients? And that's the variance aspect of the, of the model. I say that the linear model have a high bias, but, but they have a low variance. If you change the data, the coefficient would be really similar to each other, it won't be a significant difference. But you train a decision tree, that decision tree changed a lot based on the training data. So that's something that we need to take aware that there, there are these three types of errors, the error that we cannot reduce, the error produced by not getting the correct model or the correct coefficients that we should have. And the other part is how is our model affected based on the training data that we use. And here is a difference between the explanatory and predictive modeling. Explanatory modeling tries to minimize the square bias. Why? because they want, they need to know what is the, this function. Their purpose is to know what is the, the, the function that describes the behavior. But for predicted, for predictive modeling, we want to reduce both. We need to reduce both. And we have, we don't have any problem to, to increase bias if that returns a more reduction in variance. As what we have, we need to know is to reduce the error. The chapter ends explaining that we, we have for model audit all these strategies. We are going to decomposing a model prediction into components that can be attributed to particular exploratory variables conducting a sensitivity analysis for model prediction, summarizing the predictive performance of a model, 
assessing to the importance of exploratory variable, early the effecting of a exploratory variable on a model's predictions, a detailed examination of both overall and instant specific model performance. And that's, that, that's the chapter, the chapter two. He, for chapter three, he is just a guide to, to, to set up your environment, maybe with R, maybe with Python to, to continue the book. They say, oh, you need, you go to ground our project and download R, also download R Studio, instant data, and that's it. And we will explain using the, the explain function across the book. Then we also use the archivist package to, to load training models from this GitHub repo in, in the R part. Because like, oh, we don't want to train the model many times. We just want to pull up our models and explain how to apply the the audio of each, of each of them. In Python, they recommend to install from Anaconda, also to install Jupyter Notebooks. And you just need to pin install Dalets to have the, the current version of that package. He also explains what option we have in Python to, for predicting analysis. And we, uh, they explain that you can use the explainer function and we will see it more in detail. So you install it as the ads, apply the explainer based on your model, apply the predictions, the explanations, and also you can plot. So they, they have all these methods available uh, for Python. I don't know if you have any comments to this chapter you want to go back or you want to share some experience uh i guess just a poll for the rest of the group has anyone used the daleks package uh previously i have not i've not heard of it i mean i think the idea is pretty pretty interesting right kind of like the carrot package or some of the other tidy modeling packages where it just kind of sits on top of uh, other models using a consistent code base um but yeah, just just want to hear others any anyone's thoughts on on this particular package. Is it? I mean, do you enjoy it if you do use it? I haven't used it yet. <laughs> I saw in in one chat of Tidy Models, in, in the, they use this package, so that's why we are trying to treat this. Book. Okay. So if it's in the, you said it's in the, is it in the tidy models book? Yeah. Uh, okay. So that probably means it's, it's, uh, has some widespread use. So it's not, <laughs> not just one of those things that was maybe created by the authors and, you know, a couple hundred people use it or something no, like you that. No, it's like they have a really exhaustive framework around. It. It's like, uh, Dallas is a package, but it's also a family of package. Yep. Uh, I, I were really impressive. When I, I found that when I said that this we like, oh, I think this is the best friend we have seen ever, I have seen for this purpose. It's like they create a tidy model just for explaining models. Yeah, I think that's a, a really great idea and, and I'm hoping it, it comes in handy. Yeah. And they, they even explain that as the it's not just limited to this package, maybe you want Maybe they have uh, some methods that you can uh, do in some a little bit manually because they say that you maybe you can even audit the 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 quality of an API. So if you don't have any access to the model based on the predictions and changing val uh, values, they can you can have some metrics. Let's see for which method that works and for other. But yeah, it's, I, I know that it's really good integrated with with tidy models by design. Uh, they is, they they here have also scikit-learn. 
uh, yeah, let's see the integration, but they also have the theory, so we will be able to, to understand the, the mathematics behind. Well, I think we're going to end this session. Stop. Again.